Good morning. We are so thrilled that you have decided to come alongside us as we continue looking at this lesson that deals with the Psalms. Today, we are going to talk about how to sing in a strange land. And this lesson is going to be dealing with this difficult concept of suffering. I've got my co-host, Joey O, here. We've got a new series uh, that is called Understandable. We've got these small groups that are flourishing around our community. We've got rain today and in the forecast into next week here in Loma Linda. It is a full, full day, and it is a full, full conversation Congratulations also, you've made it through January, and we are just uh, praying with you, and we hope that as you continue to partner with us, you consider giving. Uh, you can give either to our Sabbath school ministry or to our media ministry. You know what to do. Just go ahead and log on to our webpage, lluc.org, and uh, you're going to click on the tab that says Give. Uh, and you can select. You can select if you want to be an ongoing partner, if you want to give a one-time gift. Um, and if your resources are a little shy or short now, don't worry. Send us a comment, a question. We value you all. We're going to pray right now, but before we do so, I also have a fun, fun uh, announcement for all of you, and that is uh, keep your ears and eyes peeled because something new is coming on our website. It's just a teaser. You'll see that uh, starting to develop in the next few weeks. Now, I've got Joey here with us, but before we get into our conversation, I'll invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, we come to you asking this question, this question that moves psalm and psalmist to say, how is it possible? How is it possible to sing songs in a strange land? How do we continue dancing when the music has ceased? And how do we continue singing when, the, when we hear the melody off key and out of tune? Lord, we simply want to ask that through these questions, your presence inundate our conversation. That it go across uh, the sound waves and the transmission so that people that are wrestling in their homes with pain and suffering and desperation might today catch the sweet, sweet scent of Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. So, Joey, how have you been? How is this week hitting you? What's what's going on in your neck of the woods as finally January is over? <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a strange January, right? We had a bout of like cold weather here and then it got hot and then rainy again. And it's just mm -hmm. all strange. But that's Southern California and just reminds us that Nothing is consistent except for God. That's that's a <laughs> great way of putting it, Joey. I don't know if if I don't know what it is about every January, but I feel like January has ninety six days in it. It just <laughs> it it just keeps going and going and going, and I know it's the first month of the year, but so much has happened, right? Yeah. We've done uh unbelievable we've now we're in the middle of understandable we've done communion we've launched a whole new bunch of new initiatives it seems like we're doing a lot and a lot has gone on in just uh the past month yeah it's i mean especially this year with unbelievable bulls which was unbelievable just a great experience with our community coming together worshiping god learning god about god um growing together Love, love to see that happen. And then, yeah, like you said, communion, um, the women's conference that's 
that's happening. Just so many things mm -hmm. um, that have happened over over the the month of January. Yeah, it's a it's a month full. It's a year full of activities packed into a month. I last Sabbath was incredible. We had worship service, then we had some training, and then the campus was flooded with uh, tweens, um, yeah. junior hires, and that was. It was interesting. It was interesting to to have them uh, interacting with with some of our leaders. But it it just it's so nice to be part of a community that is vibrant, such as such as this one. Tell tell us a little bit about the training that you did mm. with small group leaders, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for those of you who watched um, online, uh, or those of you who are local, Pastor Randy alluded to this last week. We actually have. Ten, we had 10 groups, and they're launching not this weekend, but the following week. And that got full within about a day. Wow. So we were out of spots. So now we've uh, we've just added a couple more groups. So if you are interested, particularly if you are not local and you want to participate in one of those, we do have a purely digital group that is starting on Tuesdays at 6.30. Uh, look, uh, look for that in your, uh, in, on, on our website. And it's just really nice to see uh, the response of the community. We weren't sure how it was going to be, and our leaders are so excited because whatever we're creating, we are creating in conjunction with them. So it was, it was a wonderful day. Uh, Pastor Joel provided some wonderful food, and so we're, we're excited. We're going to see where this leads. That's exciting. I love love when we create context for people to grow together mm. because that's what discipleship is all about so that i'm just excited yeah. about what you guys yeah. are doing well it, it, it's been good it's been about as good as our conversations on kind of this book uh that continues i think to both push us and to deeply deeply move us mm. uh the lesson title for this week as you know is singing songs to the lord in a strange land yeah. and uh, it alludes right to the to this verse about Israel throwing up its arps on on the trees in Babylon as they weep on the Euphrates and their captors kind of prodding them and pushing them, saying, "Sing us a song, sing us a song of Jerusalem." And I think the primary point that uh, both the lesson and these type of psalms uh, drive is that. We all, particularly those of us who make certain f claims of faith, believe that the world should operate mm. in a particular way. And so there are deep, deep challenges, both to our faith and our way of understanding the world, when we realize that it doesn't always work that way. And so how do you continue? Mm. I think the it's a beautiful lesson uh, because it is asking this question, how do you continue to sing when the music has stopped playing? Yeah, that's that's a beautiful way of saying it. How do you continue to sing when the music has stopped playing? Or we can't hear it anymore, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it's playing and we just can't hear mm -hmm. it because of the overwhelming cacophony of the noises and the sufferings of this mm -hmm. world. And that I, I love how the lesson began with this idea that this for the psalmist, it seems like one of the primary concerns are not just their own comfort mm -hmm. and their own suffering, but what this tells them about God, mm -hmm. right? Like, what is this saying about God that that good people are suffering and evil people are succeeding? Mm -hmm. What does this say about God? Does this mean that God's God is not who He says He is? He's not a good God, mm -hmm. and and that I mean that is one of the number one struggles that people face when it comes to a, a Christian faith. We're purporting that God is a good God, and yet the problem of evil makes it difficult mm -hmm. to accept that God is a good God. Mm -hmm. And that's why some people turn away from the faith. And I love how the psalm psalmists don't like sugarcoat that. They are right in there asking those questions mm -hmm. and saying, man, God, there's evil in this world. You, you say that you're going to be faithful to your covenant. Where are you? Mm. Yeah, that's, you know, that's the ultimate question. And I think beyond that, I think you, you've you noticed the, the, the real, real troubling piece in this. It's not the fact that bad stuff happens. Rather, it's the, the at least apparent randomness 
with uh, the world and how the world kind of seems to fall apart at the most inopportune moments and to them and with the most unexpected people. Mm. So it's not just that they're suffering. Mm. It is that random nature of suffering. It is the parent that did everything right and is cut mm. down um, in the prime of her or his life. It is the student uh, that goes out and is dedicated herself to a life of service and dies in a car crash. Mm -hmm. It is the parents who have been praying for a children for a child and discover that that child has an inherent birth defect that is going to tragically cut their life short. It is those things that seem so random and that actually seem to alter and they actually cause this deep, deep dissatisfaction with, with the way the world operates. And they attempt against this inherent sense of justice and fairness that we all have. That's where we get the, the problem. And so I think, uh, just backtracking a little bit, I think the first question that one needs to ask when we, when we ask the question, how can we sing songs in a strange land, is what is it within us that is being moved? Or what is this discomfort that we're feeling? And I, I believe it's this inherent sense of fairness that we think ought to govern the world. And why is it that this inherent sense of things being fair is so important? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Because when we say that God is good, what we're measuring him upon is that sense of fairness, mm -hmm. right? We're saying God is good, and that means that God should respond mm -hmm. in these and these ways, and he's not. Mm -hmm. So what does this say about God? But we could also turn that around and ask, well, what does that say about our concept of good? Mm -hmm. Does that mean that our God concept of what is good and right and fair need to be shifted? Mm -hmm. Or... Does it mean that there are things that we don't understand that are happening behind mm -hmm. the scenes, or does it mean that God is not good? So, mm -hmm. like th these are the these this these are some of the points that this conversation mm -hmm. revolves around when we see this dichotomy between suffering and a, a good and sovereign God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, at least, and for other people, might might see it differently. But for me, this inherent sense of fairness, right? A, three-year-old child with no theological training whatsoever and very little understanding of how the world ultimately operates will appeal to this yeah. code of behavior that lies beyond themselves very early on without anyone teaching them or prodding them. It is almost like it is inherently uh, programmed into us. And I think that far from arguing that this is problematic, I think that is deeply, deeply beneficial. Mm -hmm. It really starts to have us rethink of the overall picture that we have of human beings. Mm -hmm. So typically, uh, because of our early Christian church fathers who had a lot of hangups, let's face it, with sin, the, uh, the view of human nature was cast kind of in a negative light, that mm -hmm. humans were inherently bad, evil, broken creatures, and that uh, God and, and scripture and faith were these tools to redeem uh, people out of their, their broken state. And while I think that is partly right, I, I also have to recognize that this appeal to a code of ethics that exists beyond us and that we all kind of notice instinctively speaks to something about us. In other words, Perhaps human beings aren't as bad as we are meant uh, to think or as we've grown up believing. And if that's the case, then our discussions of who God is are deeply, deeply important ethically. And that's why they're, they're codified in Israel's worship experience. Mm. Because Israel is saying, hey, if I, as a human being, uh, am appealing to this greater code of ethics, then there has to be someone out there mm -hmm. who's created this code of ethics. Mm -hmm. And so I am going to charge this greater being uh, with 
uh, making sure that this person, that this being is operating within the framework of what, what uh, we all agree to be moral and ethical behavior. So it does tell us something about ourselves. It also tells us something about the need to have God, uh, beyond having God be powerful or beyond having God be a majestic or creator, it does seem to indicate that the thing we prioritize above all when we're talking about the attributes of God is that God needs to be fair. Mm, yeah. It's not just that he's powerful, but that he's also ethical, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that, that seems to be some of the struggle of some of the psalmists as they're writing their songs, like in Psalm chapter 74, or Psalms chapter 88, this idea that that God, that the reason why the psalmist is struggling with um, God not stepping in is because he does believe firmly that God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. So if God is sovereign, that must mean that the, th the evil things that are happening in this world, God is either letting mm -hmm. them happen or he is causing them to mm -hmm. happen. And so, so... What's interesting with Psalm 88, he doesn't seem to doubt the sovereignty of God so much as he he doubts, he's he's brought to the point of doubting whether God is good mm -hmm. and he's ethical. And that is troubling to him, right? That's why he says, uh, verse 14, why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me, right? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. So he's he's basically implying here that God is bringing him to the point of death. It's God's terrors that are causing this mm -hmm. because he firmly believes in the sovereignty of God. And that is, that is a challenge, right? Like that's, that's always the tension is if God is all powerful and all good, why is there suffering right. in the world? Right. And that is why I think, and it's such a apropos Sabbath to be discussing about this, because if you were, if, with us for first service, um, we won't give the whole sermon away, but you know that part, the primary uh, theme throughout the message was that you need to collapse the distance between your world and the world that scripture was written in. And I think one of the ways in which you collapse that distance that Randy spoke about is you recognize the genre of literature that you're dealing with. Psalms is poetry. And I think it, it's it's very, very treacherous to start building a systematic theology mm -hmm. about the character and the nature of God using first and foremost poetry, mm -hmm. uh, because poetry, by its literary nature, uh, has to use simile, has to use hyperbole. So there's a lot of things that are going on literally in, in the literary co uh, construction of the Psalms that we should have in, cons in consideration. What I think is a good, a good starting point, perhaps, to start building the systematic theology as it pertains to the character of God as we understand it, has to do with the level of distress that you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the psalmist is distressed, that God being sovereign seems to be amoral, mm -hmm. or perhaps even immoral, mm -hmm. um, is, is problematic. And that leads us, I think, to the greatest paradox within, within the history of not just Christian theology, uh, but Jewish theology as well. And that is, how do you uphold three primary ideas, and how do these ideas interplay with each other? So how do you have the sovereignty of God, the experience of pointless suffering in the world, or what we might call unjust or unfair suffering in the world. And what do you do with the idea that human beings have free will? Those three, mm -hmm. those three primary concepts are really difficult to kind of mesh together, mm -hmm. but they're three things that mm -hmm. are central tenets of both Jewish and Christian theology. Yeah, I love how you brought up that point that the Psalms are poetry. And what, one thing that I love about the fact that they're poetry is that they appeal more to the emotions mm -hmm. than just the intellect, right? And when we're going through suffering or we're give, going through times when we feel abandoned by God, we 
sometimes we we may not think in hyperboles, but we feel in hyperboles, mm-hmm. right? Like it does feel like God is evil. It does mm. feel like sometimes that God has completely abandoned us. It feels like those things. What even though logically we may know, well, that's not the reality, mm. right? We we know that in the past God has been faithful. Mm. In the future He will be faithful. But in that moment, the feeling is this overwhelming mm. hyperbole of emotion, and that's what I. That's part of what I love about the Psalms is because it's not a, afraid to express those w- words and those feelings. And put them on paper and even be canonized in scripture like mm-hmm. we've talked about. So that I think there is that beauty because um, as I was reading through this lesson, one of the one, one of the Psalms was um, Psalm 42, mm-hmm. as the deer panted. And that's a song that I have sung many, many mm-hmm. times before, right? But it never struck me that actually what it's talking about is the reason why this psalmist is panting for God is because... He, he feels abandoned right. by God, right? Which is which is a little bit different than what the message of the song is. Right. The song is makes it sound like, oh, we we just love you, God, so much, so we pant after you because of. And there's, I guess, there's an element of that, but it's really about I am so desperate for your presence right now because I don't see you anywhere. Mm-hmm. I don't know where you are, God, and so I'm panting for you like a like a like a a, a parched deer panteth after mm-hmm. water and is desperate to find it he's that desperate to find god yeah and you have that uh that emotion in direct contradiction to the emotion of the psalm that you just cited right mm-hmm. psalm 88 where the psalmist knows where god is he can acutely feel the presence of god mm-hmm. And that presence or that feeling God's presence in his midst is not a positive thing. Yeah. It actually seems like the plea of the psalmist is, hey, God, could you focus anywhere mm. else? Oh, because wow. your wrath lies heavily upon me mm. and you have overwhelmed me with all of your waves. So it's not that I can't see you or I can't feel you. Is It is that your presence mm. is causing me deep, deep, deep distress because I am being victimized wow. by your wrath. And so it's it's an interesting, within the same book, right, with yeah. two songs that Israel sang, yeah. uh, that Israel sings and that Israel had sung throughout her history, these two songs are kind of in conjunction, but the, the feeling or the emotion that is driving them is deeply different. One, God, I feel abandoned. Where are you? Two, God, you're here and you're crushing me. Yeah. Could you please leave? <laughs> and to be honest, I felt, uh, I felt in my life, maybe not at this, de- not not at this degree, but I felt that same range of emotions many a time in my life, um, where there are occasions where I could say, "Hey, where I where I think, hey God, I really need some help here. Mm-hmm. I I can't find my way out." And others in which I'm saying, what gives? Mm -hmm. I have dedicated my life to you. I I try to live a moral life. I try to think about uh, those around me. And it seems like everything I I do is meeting uh, or is being met with, uh, with things that are causing me deep, deep anguish. Yeah. So that even within yourself, in different situations, you have different emotional responses to those situations. Yeah. Which is, which is why, again, love the Psalms because there's this whole myriad Mm -hmm. of reactions Mm -hmm. and responses and feelings. What I find interesting about the Psalms also is that, that even though the psalmists feel this way and sometimes feel it very, very strongly, or at least describe it in very um, hyperbolic ways, there is the mo- the two most common responses, and I think the lesson goes into this, is that one is that it, it leads to confession. Mm-hmm. Like maybe God has turned away because there is, there is something broken in me that needs, to, and that's a self-examination that mm-hmm. we need to do. Or the other is to just lean in even more and say, God, don't leave me. Mm-hmm. And just like reach out to God mm-hmm. and hold on tight. That seems, which is which is really fascinating because I, I, I wonder if the, 
those are the two most common responses now. Mm. Because it seems like, and, and that may not be a fair comparison because these are people who are obviously, they, they have a strong relationship with God, but it, it makes me wonder, nowadays it seems like a lot of the response is actually not leaning in or confession. It's more just disengagement, mm. right? Like God, either God, you must not be good or God, you must not be real. Right. And just completely disengaging. Yeah. Hmm. So it, it, it did make me wonder, like, what's the difference? Why is it that the psalmist, when experiencing some very similar situations that we do now, they respond with either leaning in or confession. And many times we respond with disconnection. Yeah. And that leaning in, I think, takes on a lot of forms. It'll take on the form of I need you desperately. It'll take on the form of, I hate you incredibly. <laughs> um, it'll take out on the form of, where were you? <laughs> yeah. um, but, but the presence of God is never doubted. Mm. And I think, I think that forces us to recognize that faith is sometimes a little more complex mm. than, than you or I or anyone else is comfortable with. Mm. Uh, one of the, I think, classic, classic works on um, on kind of dealing with this idea of suffering uh, is written by now uh, uh, the classic uh, book by Rabbi, Rabbi Kushner, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Mm. And in it, uh, Kushner starts to kind of deconstruct as only somebody that is involved in the peaks and valleys of doing life with a congregation can, um, in a way that I think theologian, professional theologians uh, or people who are solely involved in academics can do. So Krishna remembers uh, this, this story about a couple. Uh, he opens actually his book with the story about a couple in his, in his congregation uh, that have a, a young child and the young child uh, is run over by a, by an automobile and dies. And um, this is obviously very tragic in a, in a tight-knit community in New York where, where Kushner is ministering. And so he goes uh, to his uh, to this family's home. They're not a particularly engaged family within his within the synagogue, but he knows them. He mm -hmm. goes in, into this hall, into their home, uh, in order to sh uh, sit shiva, and um, the first thing that they are that they greet him with is, Rabbi, we forgot to go to temple uh, for for the for pa for Passover. We didn't go to temple, and in their mind, without any prodding. The connection had been made between we did something wrong and God is now punishing us for, for it. And while I think, uh, and, and the lesson kind of talks about this, but as I read it, I felt, I said, well, it, at least for me that uh, in, in you, we do life with a, with a congregation in very much the same ways. This needs to be really clear. Mm. Bad things don't happen to you because God is punishing you. Mm. Sometimes we make choices, and those choices have consequences. Mm -hmm. Those consequences are separate from any punishing that God is trying to mete out. Mm -hmm. um, and so to when we're talking about confession, we're, I, think, I think we're talking about confession in the truest form of the word. Mm -hmm. It's the recognition that we're hurting and so now here we are coming to God, splayed open with nothing to hide. Here's who we are, God. Take it as you must. Um, I don't think, um, and I, I know you and I, when, when, we're, when we're facing somebody that is living in these spaces, we, we, we don't say, hey, there's some secret sin in your life that God is now punishing you for. Um, because... That that really, uh, I think, creates some problems with with the way that we've decided uh, to view God. Uh, we worship God not because He's more powerful than us. Mm. We worship God not because He He simply made us. We worship God because God loves us beyond measure, 
And it is that thing, I think, it is that thing that the authors of the Psalms are trying to protect. This idea that, hey, Babylon might have come and conquered us. And within the mindset of that time, that means that their gods are more powerful than you. So why are we not worshiping the gods of Babylon? Well, we're not worshiping the gods of Babylon because Yahweh has done something for us. There is this relationship there, and we are trying to preserve this relationship by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. And so in a very practical way, I think, Joey, uh, to those people who are going through situations of deep, deep, deep despair, the invitation is, uh, first off, not to try to figure out why it happened. Mm -hmm. I wish I could tell you. The reality is I don't know. Evil uh, suffering, pain. There is a mystery mm -hmm. there that is unexplainable. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, uh, w what I do know 100% is that God didn't cause it. Yeah. Um, what I also know, though, is that God is uh, gracious enough to hold uh, that place for you to vent and spew anything you have to spew. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes God different than than anyone else yeah yeah so much good there um I, I do think it's important to be very clear that um god the intent of of or when bad things happen that it's never a response for us to say well god is punishing us mm -hmm. for this and that's why this terrible thing terrible things happen we live in a sinful world mm -hmm. right a lot of terrible things happen but and now, to be fair, there are times where the psalmists seem to be in that direction, like, oh, this terrible thing is happening to you, to me, because, oh, God. But again, that I think, I think in those moments, it's also important to remember what you said at the beginning, that, that there is, that we tread on difficult waters when we try to make theology based solely on poetry, right? And so there is a lot of emotions there. And so this is, at times, the psalmist thinking and feeling out loud, mm -hmm. right? And and those moments, it feels like a punishment, and that's what the psalmist mm -hmm. is, um, is expressing. That doesn't mean that it literally is mm -hmm. a punishment from God. So that, I think that that distinction is important. And also, to be fair to the psalmist, the things that they are longing for is not always just a resolution of the suffering, but feeling close to God mm -hmm. again. And I think that's where some of that confession comes in, mm -hmm. is feeling like maybe there is something in my life that has separated me mm -hmm. from God, from the presence of God. Not that he's causing me this suffering, but I even in the midst of this suffering, I can't sense mm -hmm. his presence. Is there something in the way? And that's where that self-examination mm -hmm. does sometimes come in for the psalmist, right? To say, um, I, I want to feel close to you. Now, that doesn't mean that it's always that the psalmist is right. moved, right? Because suffering makes us feel far from God often, right? Like terrible things mm -hmm. happen. It it creates a veil that we can't see God through. It doesn't mean that God isn't close. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we've moved away from God. But there is sometimes a veil that that suffering. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's just interesting that the psalmist, their whole intent, whether it's by confession or by reaching out to God, or even shouting in anger at God, their whole intent is to break mm. through that veil. Mm -hmm. They don't want that veil there anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's their longing and their passion. And, and that comes through in the Psalms. What's also interesting, what you said at the end about how the answers don't always come. We don't always know why these terrible things happen. And so sometimes being so desperate to find out why actually is counterproductive to the process of healing. Yeah. And what's interesting about the Psalms, like one of the Psalms that were in the, one of the Psalms that was quoted in the lesson was Psalm 77, is that there is a resolution at the end of Psalm 77, but there is no answer. Right. Like God comes through and he is faithful. Like the Psalmist ends with, oh, the, you know, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. There's this conviction that God is good and that he is faithful. 
but there is no answer no to what answer. is God. I mean, that happens with Job too. Mm -hmm. Job, God never gives him the answer, right? He just says, uh, just trust me, basically, right. is what he says at the end of that. So, so sometimes being obsessed with trying to find out why can get in the way of mm. the healing and uh, mm. that, that we need to get through the suffering. Yeah. And I think the beauty of, of what you're pointing us to is that there is kind of this multifaceted approach mm. to dealing with suffering yeah. where you're going to pick whatever modality of, of song, whatever tempo, whatever accompaniment, whatever, whatever type and genre of song you need to sing in order to get through what you need to get through. That is what you, you are and you have permission to do so, whether it, whether it is theologically sensible or not, mm. because suffering is not the time to build theology. Um, when you said uh, that there are Psalms where it seems like Israel has, fall, has failed, and so God is punishing them, there's a reason for that. I was very young, and I, I struggled... Uh, most of this week to try and come up with, with an analogy that would be helpful. And uh, yesterday evening, I finally think I, I, I thought, oh yeah, that makes sense. I was very young and uh, my parents were traveling a lot for work. And so sometimes they would take me on the road with them. And uh, it happened, I mean, I don't know how often it was, but at least in my recollection of uh, these these drives, uh, we saw a lot of accidents. Now I don't know if, and I'm sure, uh, every time we I went went along with them, uh, there wasn't an accident. But in my mind, those moments were so traumatic that it seemed like every time we were on that six hour journey, there we we encountered a, an accident with a couple fatalities. So I remember. Uh, saying, deciding that I didn't want to drive with them anymore. Mm. And then I remember uh, my my mom and my dad coming to my room to say goodbye to me be before they went on, on one of these business trips. And I looked at them and I started crying. I must have been six, seven at the time. Mm. And I started crying and I told them, I don't want you to go mm. because I don't want you to get in an accident and I don't want you to die. Oh, wow. And I'm weeping, and I told them, uh, promise me, promise me, swear to me that you're not going to get into, that you won't get into an accident and die and uh, leave uh, my brother and I by myself, by ourselves. And my, my mom stands there and says, yeah, I promise. Mm -hmm. And I immediately just... And I was able to go to sleep and they went and uh, they kept going on these business trips for a couple more years and nothing ever happened. And um, obviously they're still around. So um, it all worked out well in the end. Now, hmm. logic, right? Logic would tell you, well, that is a promise that it is impossible for any parent to keep. Mm -hmm. None of these people that, that I saw uh, tragically pass away on, on a freeway, none of them had the intention or the control or, or control over what had happened. But at that moment, my six-year-old self in agony needed to believe that someone was in control. Wow. That's what I yearned for the most. Much like traumatized Israel uh, as their temple has been burnt to the ground and their whole national identity is collapsing, they need to believe that someone is in control. Mm. So notice that theology, mm. good theology at least, wow. always takes the back seat to what we need as emotional creatures. And God is able to say, I'm going to allow you to build some pretty wonky theology about me and I'm going to allow you to say some pretty weird stuff about me, such as, you failed, that's why I'm going to punish you. 
I'm going to allow that because I know that emotionally what you need more than anything else at this point is to believe that someone is in control. So just think about what that God is willing for our benefit sometimes to be the villain in the story. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to need a moment to process that. That's uh, wow. Yeah. I mean, it, it does sound like God in that God does God does even at times um, put put his reputation on the mm -hmm. line in order to do what is best for us, right? Um, and so it does seem to answer some of those questions, like why does God allow, why, why doesn't God like speak up against some of these like weird theologies, as the way that you put it, strange theologies that people had about him, strange conceptions that people had about him said, no, that is not right. That's not who I am. I mean, eventually he seems to do it, right? Right when when Jesus comes and it he he had there's a sort of reset of of who God is and mm -hmm. um, and just building and reflecting on that experience over the years um, through the writings of Paul and the disciples of Jesus and all of that, we get a diff uh, a a fuller theology of who God is. But that's fascinating, yeah. Mm -hmm. That God sometimes allows people to think about him negatively because that's what they need emotionally mm. to get through a difficult moment. Mm. And I think that switch that you're talking about comes with maturation, mm. right? It comes with spiritual growth, uh, insight, and maturation. Obviously now, um, when my parents go on, on, on a drive and on a long road trip, I don't go into the room and say, hey, promise me that you're not going to get into a car accident. I go into their room and I say, I love you. And should you get into a car accident, a tragic car accident, I have the tools mm. to make sense of life without you, of my life without you. Mm. But that's taken a whole 30 some odd year journey as I've grown and I've understand and I've developed resiliency and I've done all these all these things where I can now say where I can now look back at myself at six and say, well, that was that was probably not true in the in the sense that they could promise something to me and they knew it. Mm -hmm. But wow, wasn't that merciful that they were allowed to fit into whatever picture uh, I needed at that point. And so I think um, I think there is something, there is something biological that occurs to us or that occurs with us when uh, when trauma triggers. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, looking a little bit at uh, the science of trauma, there is kind of this regression. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I think, it's it's really important to allow people to say whatever they need to say mm -hmm. in the moment of trauma. And that sometimes is really scary mm -hmm. because, you know, if you've ever been at the bedside or uh, or at a gravesite uh, where there is something traumatic that you can't explain has happened, uh, and pe you'll hear people say stuff that is every bit as strange as uh, this idea that, hey, I did something wrong, God's going to punish me. Um, and a lot of those, a lot of times we, we immediately pop up with, don't, mm. don't say that, mm -hmm. don't speak that way. Um, it, it looks like the Psalms is saying, no, 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 speak that way, because that's what you need. Mm. There will be a time for reflection and spiritual maturation and introspection mm. and all these other things. But at that moment, mm. the most important thing is to stop the bleeding. Mm. Um, and so this is what God does. God says, okay, we need to stop the bleeding. Just speak. Mm -hmm. Speak and reflection and thoughtfulness can come later. Wow. No, it's so true what you said about how in, in traumatic moments that there is a regression that happens, right? Um, even when it's sometimes when it's sadness or mourning or loss, other times when it's even anger, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm sure that all of us have said things in the moment of anger that reflecting back, we're like, no, that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not 
But in that moment, it feels mm-hmm. so true. And so allowing grace for people in that moment to express what they need, because that's what God does for mm-hmm. us, right? It's right there. Yeah. So allowing people the space to say what they need and not having to correct them in the moment, because that's not the moment. You know, in the midst of, like you said, in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the anger, in the midst of the trauma, what we need most is not someone correcting our theology, the nuances of our theology, but someone to be empathetic and right. listen and support. And then when we've worked through some of those emotions, then then we can reflect back and say, well, maybe it wasn't exactly like this, right? But yeah, I think that there is there is there is an important point there for us to allow in moments of deep distress like this, the grace for people to just express what they're feeling in the moment, mm-hmm. as wonky or strange as it may be. And that's, I think, why you don't hear God speaking up in, in God's own defense. Um, he certainly could. Uh, but you remember, um, you remember CPE. I tell people that are doing CPE training all the time, the best advice that I can give you mm. is to be quiet. Mm. When you enter that that's room, so and that's what, what some of your preceptors, like the really good CPE pre- preceptors do, they'll say, okay, you, you walk into that room, you're there to be quiet. You're there mm. kind of, a, of as a receptacle of people's anger, mm. grief, questions, uh, doubt. You are there uh, to be quiet and to be a receptacle. And it seems like before we had any actual uh, literature on trauma or on gr- or on suffering or on grief recovery, God was the original CPE preceptor wow. saying, I'm going to walk into this room yeah. and I'm going to allow you to say whatever you need to say. Mm. And at in that moment, I am going to be silent. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean that God is always silent, right? Mm -hmm. The beauty is that at some point in the story, both of the psalmist of Scripture and of us, God has spoken, Mm -hmm. and uh, he's spoken very loudly at Calvary. Yeah, I mean, but we see that, that God does that for Elijah. Mm -hmm. When Elijah rails at God, he does that for Job. Mm -hmm. He's quiet for most of Job. But he does eventually speak Mm -hmm. up. So maybe the question of... um, when we ask the question, where is God? Maybe part of the the answer is that he's listening. Mm-hmm. God is listening. What a great way to finish. Where is God? You, y'all you write that down because that is a pearl of wisdom. Where is God? Well, God is listening. Joey, pray for us. Mm. Our good and gracious God, oh, the grace that you show us as we examine the Psalms, it reminds us over and over how truly gracious you are, that you would be willing to be misunderstood, that you would be willing to put your reputation on the line so that, so that we can get our emotions out, get our feelings out, um, get what we need in that moment, that you do that for us over and over and over again. Throughout the, the, the days of earthly history, you have done that from, from the first sin in, in the Garden of Eden, all the way up to today and into the future. Lord, thank you for that. And help us also to be those listening receptacles of emotions as well. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. We'll see you next week.